Good evening, everyone. My name is Russ Gannam, and I am the Dean of International Programs at the University of Iowa. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event in solidarity with Asians and Pacific Islanders in America, organized by the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies. International Programs is proud to co-sponsor tonight's event and to support our Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander community. We know all too well that the last few years have been extremely difficult for people identifying as AAPI in the United States. Recent acts of violence and hatred have only intensified these challenges while undermining our efforts to value and uplift all members of our society. International program staunchly opposes all forms of racism and xenophobia, and our messages denouncing discrimination of any kind date to the beginning of the pandemic. But statements are not enough. If we are to combat aggression, we must understand its causes and develop strategies to prevent it. That is the purpose of tonight's forum. Educating our community on these issues is the greatest contribution we can make. Before we start, please let me thank Cynthia Chow, Director of the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies, as well as Dong Wong Liu, Associate Director of CAPS, for organizing this event. In addition, special thanks go to Marcella Hernandez and Xiaoping Zhang of the UI College of Dentistry for their co-sponsorship. And I would also like to thank Gabriela Rivera and the Tippi College of Business and the large number of departments, centers, and individuals at the University of Iowa who have lent their names as co-sponsors. And you see the names of these co-sponsors displayed before you. The outpouring of support has been overwhelming and we are profoundly grateful to our academic community for their instantaneous gestures of solidarity with our AAPI populations. Warm thanks also go to Seralta Peterson, Amy Green, Ben Partridge, and Amy Brewster of International Programs Communications and Constituent Relations Team for overseeing the publicity as well as the technology related to tonight's event. And finally, thanks go to tonight's audience. Your attendance is testimony to your solidarity. In expressing my gratitude to each of you, please let me turn things over to Cynthia so that we may begin tonight's program. Good evening. My name is Cynthia Chow, and I'm the incumbent director for the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies at the University of Iowa. On behalf of the co-organizers and planning committee comprising international programs, the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies, the School of Dentistry's International Affairs and Programs Committee, Office and Committee of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, and TP College of Business, we thank you for joining us for this important webinar in solidarity with Asians and Pacific Islanders in America. Currently, hate crimes against Asians and Pacific Islanders appear much in the news. Any kind of violence is always saddening and troubling. Are the latest reports of hate rising due to increased incidents, improved reporting systems, better awareness of the issue that empowers victims to report or a confluence of other factors. Asians and Pacific Islanders in America cover a wide spectrum of race, ethnicity, and heritage histories. Speakers in this webinar include experts with deep experiences in working with Asians and Pacific Islanders in social work, advocacy, and Southeast Asian languages. This webinar, also presents resources that are available to address biases and violence to support Asian and Pacific Islander communities. As featured in the accompanying slide, this event has been made possible only because of the partnership and spirit of solidarity for our shared humanity by numerous colleges, faculties, departments, centers, and programs across the University of Iowa as well as the tremendous support that we have gotten from community collaborators. They are hereby gratefully acknowledged by me in alphabetical order. Alliant Energy, Asian American Student Union, Asian Pacific American Cultural Center, Carver College of Medicine Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, 
College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, College of Public Health, Department of Anthropology, Department of Asian and Slavic Languages and Literatures, <coughs> Communication Studies, Department of Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies, Department of Geographical and Sustainability Sciences, Department of History, Department of Linguistics, Department of Political Science, Department of Religious Studies, Department of Surgery, Carver College of Medicine, Global Health Studies Program, International Studies Program, Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, Oberman Center for Advanced Studies, Pan Asian Council, St. Thomas More Parish Stephen Ministry, School of Art and Art History, School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and the University of Iowa Division of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for this webinar, Dr. Xiaoping Chang, Assistant Professor, Periodontics Department at the University of Iowa College Dentistry. Dr. Chang is also an active member in the College of Dentistry's International Affairs and Programs Committee. Dr. Chang. Thank you, Cynthia. Since the pandemic, we have been battling the hate virus against the Asians and the Asian Americans. Today, we invited three outstanding speakers to join us to discuss this critical issue and raise the awareness of a racism against the Asians. First, before we start our session, I would like to announce several housekeeping rules. Audience questions for panelists are welcome. We ask that you type your questions into the Q and the A pen located along the bottom of the screen. If preferred, questions may be submitted anonymously by clicking the designated box. Questions can be submitted at any time during the webinar. As the moderator, I will share those questions with panelists to answer live following all presentations. The chat feature has been disabled to send messages to panelists, but if you are a dental student, please pay attention to your chat box for specific instructions for receiving your CE credits. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Ham. Dr. Ham is the chair and professor at Boston University School of uh, Social Work. She bridges epidemiology, theory building, and uh, intervention development in order to better understand the causes of a uh, depression, self-harm, and uh, suicidal behaviors among Asian American population. Her research includes randomized clinical trials, survey research, quantitative research, and a large database studies. She has developed a culturally grounded intervention called AWARE, which stands for Asian American Women's Action in Resilience and Empowerment, and the Youth AWARE which have been implemented in colleges and high schools. Today, the title of her talk is How We Can Prevent History from Repeating Itself, Addressing Anti-Asian Discrimination and Supporting Asian Youth. Dr. Ham. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so much, everybody. America in Korean. Is written as Migu. This is based on two Chinese characters. Mi means beauty, Gu means country. When we put two words together, America becomes literally a beautiful country. Growing up in Seoul, Korea, I had a fantasy about America. I imagined a beautiful country with a charming people and great economic opportunities, the land of democracy, justice, and equity. In this beautiful country, We've been dealing with crisis, health crisis, crisis with racism, xenophobia related to COVID-19. 
anti-Asian hate crime has been growing up, has been soaring in a year 2020. Although the anti-hate crime in general has gone down 7% for overall, uh, specifically anti-Asian hate crime has gone up 150%. And you can see that the cities such as Boston, Los Angeles, and New York City has gone up incredibly. Hate crime also includes this vandalism. Vandalism is critical because it instills a fear to every single member of the race or ethnicity group. Now, we have been, um, our, our research team has been funded by National Science Foundation to understand the prevalence of COVID-19 related hate crime or uh, discrimination among Asian Americans. What we have found was that 68% of young others, Asian American young others and their family members have reported that they've been, uh, discrim they've been experiencing discrimination. And 15% of them reported that they have been experienced a verbal assault or physical assault. We have associated that, um, we have found that COVID-19 discrimination was specifically associated with the higher rates of PTSD symptoms. So, so those PTSD symptoms are intrusive thoughts, anger, hypervigilance, somatic symptoms, decreased self-esteem, and numbing and anger. Now, behind all these numbers, we always find the stories. So these are the several stories that has been reported by our uh, research participants. My dad sent me a text message about an Asian woman who got acid thrown at her and tells me to be careful. I tell him I live in a predominantly Asian neighborhood, so it's okay, but in reality, I'm scared. My dad also tells me that he gets stares at the grocery store. While nothing direct happens to me, neither of us, we live in fear. My youngest cousins are two and five years old and have been kicked out of their preschools because of their race. So these are the examples of racialized trauma. And the racialized trauma, when you listen to these things, they have themes. They have lost a sense of safety. They are grieving. There's a collective grieving. And there is a sense of shame. Now, it's been almost a year, a little bit over a year since COVID-19 pandemic has been announced. And now we can see the long-term effect of COVID-19. And recent data shows that Asian Americans have the higher rates of the long-term unemployment, higher than white, higher than black, higher than Latinx. This is a recent data showing that Asian American young students, they have or they are the most reluctant to return to school. So based on Boston public school data, 35 students are the only one only 35 students wanted to go back to school, whereas all other ethnic groups or racial groups are over 50%. Now, as you can see, and as you hear, anti-discrimination toward Asian Americans are not the new thing. You might have heard that many Chinese, Chinese Americans came to this country during the gold rush. And they have built railroads. At the time, Chinese became a threat of taking jobs from Americans. So in 1871, one of the largest mass lynching in American history took place in LA. When 19 Chinese residents were killed by a white mob. And subsequently, Congress enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, and because of that, Chinese became ineligible for naturalization. So when you look at these pictures, Chinese and Asians have been perceived as economic threats, untrustworthy, and immoral. I'm gonna talk about three predominant 
and pervasive bias, prejudice, and myth on Asians. Number one is perpetual foreigners. Perpetual foreigners is that no matter how many years, no matter how many generations that you have lived in America, you're still considered or viewed as foreigners. I'm gonna give you an example. So last year, um, after pandemic was announced, there was a, sometime in July. It was really, really beautiful day. So my family wanted to go to the beach. So we went to the second beach in, um, in uh, Rhode Island. So we had a really great time. We got a lot of suns. We got out of the, uh, the beach area and we were trying to load up so that we come back to Massachusetts. So um, we were trying to put some stuff in the car. And we hear the sound from another guy. He sounds like about 20 years old. And he was yelling at our family, telling us, go back home. So, you know, at the time, I know the Rhode Island, they did not want anybody from uh, any other places, okay? So my family members, we got into the car and we were debating. Are they saying that we're going back? We have to go back home, Massachusetts or Asia? Well, in fact, we don't have a house in Asia. Number two, minor minority stereotypes. You hear that Asian Americans are wealthy, they have high income, they have high socioeconomic status. Yes, apparently it is true that when you look at median income of Asian American Pacific Islanders, they are tops in, uh, among all groups. However, we have to understand, we have to recognize that Asian Americans are comp comprised with so many different ethnicity, ethnic groups. So Asian Indians and Philippines, Filipinos, they have the highest incomes among Asian Americans. However, when you look at Hmong, Bangladesh, and Laotians, Cambodians, these are the groups which belong in poverty level. And we also need to recognize the various and the vast income disparity among Asian American groups. So Asians in the top 10% of the income distribution earned 11 times as much as Asians in the bottom 10%. And this disparity is the largest compared to Black, White, and Latinx. Now, you also hear that Asian American students are smart, they are all in college, but it is not necessarily true. When you look at Vietnamese, Laotians, Hmong, Cambodians, 25 to 30% of those students, young students, do not graduate from high school. So then this bias and prejudice and the myth, what's the impact on Asian Americans? Number one is mental health effects. We studied more than 2,000 Asian American women and adolescents for the last 10 years. And I have recognized that this group of young people are trapped in multiple levels. So I created a theory called the trap model. First is inner voice trap. It's a psychological trap. They constantly feel the pressure to achieve. They need to perform. No matter how well they perform, no matter how much they have accomplished, they have a big sense of they're not feeling good enough. They're never good enough. Next level is a family trap. They are children of immigrants. Children of immigrants by default, they are struggling multiple problems, multiple issues dealing with the cultural acculturation gap between their parents and their children. And the children also are dealing with the parents' of trauma. They also are trapped by race, institutional race, microaggression, racial slur, and invisibility they're experiencing. Despite of all this, they are suffering alone. So let's take a look at the epidemiological findings. Asian Americans have a higher risk of depression. They worry more than other ethnic or racial groups. They have higher level of anxiety. 
they also have a high level of suicide. When you look at Asian American young women, suicide is number one cause of death. Okay. Whereas other group of the young women, suicide is not number one reason or cause of death. Despite all of this, Asian American, if you look at the yellow bar, they are least likely to have a mental health diagnosis, least likely to receive mental health psychotherapy, least likely to receive drug um, medication treatment. Then what about structural inequality and inequity? Because of this modern minority myth, a modern minority myth is very insidious and it permeates all different levels, federal, state, and local, and individual levels. So for the last 26 years, National Institute of Health spent 0.17% of the total budget for clinical research on Asian Americans plus Native Hawaiians plus Pacific Islanders. But we have to recognize the fact that Asian Americans are the fastest growing population in the US and then they are going to reach about 10% of the population in 2025. 20, 20, um, and uh, National Institute of Health recently announced a very important initiative is called NIH Unite. This is to address the structural racism. They want to reduce the structural racism, but the initial report came out and it neglected to include Asian American communities. And these structural inequities are all over. Let's take a look at the college president. Asian American make up a mere 2% of the college presidents. And you're looking at Asian American women, right? Asian American women are least likely among all, all women to be promoted to leadership position. And including the Congress, only 3% of the Congress women or men are Asians. Then what are the action plans that we're gonna to have to do? What are the action plans are available that we push forward to change? Number one is that we need a bold action from the federal level, federal investments for Asian American health and well-being is urgent. What does that mean? That means we need to have a data collection. We need to track the hate incidents. We need to track how we can improve the well-being and health of Asian Americans. We need to disaggregate the data for Asian Americans because we have so many different multiple ethnicities among Asian Americans. And we cannot fix what we can see. That's really important because we need to have a data in order for us to develop a responsive policy so that our status quo should be changed. Number two is policy changes are required in education and universities and pre-college school must teach the history of Asian Americans in their curricula on exclusion and biases. Because really understanding the history is going to really help Asian Americans or other racial groups the recognizing their contribution in America. Implicit bias training is necessary and really need to understand the words are the seeds for the violence. And education should not just stay just in class setting because there are lots of discrimination occurring in the sports field as well. And we need to have an ongoing conversation just like this. We're having this wonderful seminar and webinar and we need to have consi consistent and continuity and consistent conversation on structural racism that Asian Americans are facing. So how we can do that? We can create affinity group, we can create therapy group. 
our research group developed AWARE intervention. This is specialized in the Asian American women's group and has the efficacy trial. And we have actually shown the evidence of the efficacy. We also developed the youth AWARE, which is designed for specifically for the youth, Asian American youth. And we really think it's so important for other members, other allies to take the bystander intervention training. And how can we instill hope? I think the bottom line is the three things. We need to take actions. We need to have activism. And we need to create, maintain our allyship. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Han, for your very powerful speech. And I um, really like your uh, the challenges that you brought up um, by the structural um, racism against the Asians and Asian Americans. And I specifically like you uh, advocating the solutions to those challenges. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is um, Ms. Eunice Kim. Eunice Kim is a program manager at Stop AAPI Hate, a coalition that addresses anti-Asian racism and xenophobia amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Eunice received a Bachelor of Arts in Asian American Studies from San Francisco State in 2017, then received a Master of a Public Administration degree from San Francisco state in 2020. Throughout Eunice's uh, career, her, research, her work consistently aligned with civil engagement, advocacy, and the public administration. Eunice identifies as a first-generation Korean American and was born and raised in Monterey Bay. The topic for uh, Eunice's talk is understanding hate against the Asian Americans. Eunice? Thank you. And thank you, um, Professor Hom, for that informative and powerful presentation. All right, so I want to recognize University of Iowa for holding this space and acknowledging the trauma that's currently happening in our communities. Stop API Hate tracks and responds to incidents of hate, violence, and discrimination. Our approach recognizes that in order to effectively address anti-Asian racism, we must work to end all forms of structural racism and oppression in BIPOC communities. Today, I will lift up real stories of individual and also go through our data that we've been collecting over the past year. So I want to lift up real stories of anti-Asian incidents that we've collected from March 2020 to February 2021. We want, we want to make an effort not to intellectualize these incidents as numbers or data, but lift up individuals that reported on our platform and humanize their stories. So please take a moment with me to read these incidents. A white fisherman harassed among fishermen at the public fishing park saying that all Asian COVID-19 fishermen must go back to Minnesota and never come back to South Dakota. He said that he forgot his pistol and, or otherwise he would shoot everyone. He came really close to among fishermen's face and said out loud that he's going to kick a COVID-19's ass. My elderly parents were walking with my two-year-old and some 20 to 30-year-old drove by and screamed F China at the stoplight. They felt very unsafe, especially with the child. Two young boys blurted out, hey, Corona, to my son and I as we were leaving a playground after a quick one-on-one -on -one at basketball practice. Both of them appeared to be middle school children, and this happened in Iowa. Middle school child was physically attacked and verbally assaulted at the schoolyard. A bully accused him of having COVID-19 and told the child to go back to China. When the child responded that he was not Chinese, he punched him in the head 20 times. In a diner, there was an Asian woman and her teenage son. And when her son went to the restroom, there were hundreds of racist comments, but also sexual comments about her body. Guys said things like, you guys started Corona and ruined our lives. Just die already. And you're very beautiful. How old are you? Slide this snap and send some news. 
A white male struck me as I was walking through the aisle of a hardware store and verbally attacked me, saying, shut up, you monkey, F you, China man, go back to China, and bringing that Chinese virus over here. I want to take a few breaths and moments of silence for the individuals who experienced these incidents and for the individuals who lost their lives due to discrimination of race, ethnicity, or immigration status. Last month in Atlanta, an individual target three, targeted three Asian spas and shot and killed six Asian women. Just this month in Indianapolis, an individual targeted a FedEx that was overwhelmingly staffed by six. He shot and killed four individuals from the Sikh community. Please take a moment with me in a, in a few moments of silence for our community experiencing hate and have lost their lives. Thank you for taking those um, few moments of silences with me. As we remember these stories and we bring up um, and we lift these stories, we're safekeepers of these incidents and we want to make sure that we um, humanize their stories. So thank you for doing that with me. And now I'm going to go into our national data that we've been collecting. I wanted to show you a quick snapshot of the incidents we received. Um, from March 2020 to February 2021. We received over 3,800 reports in 49 weeks. After the Atlanta shootings, we received 1,000 more, and, we, and this is only the tip of the iceberg. This is only a fraction of the incidents that are happening. Not only are communities traumatized, they're faced with barriers to reporting, such as language barriers and access to the internet. It's important to recognize that not all of these hate in incidents are hate crimes. Nevertheless, these incidents are extremely traumatizing, as Dr. Hom was pointing out, and our, com our communities are being impacted immensely. A high number of reports are in urban areas and counties with high API populations, such as um, California or New York State. It is disturbing to see that 70% of our respondents are women, but this is actually not surprising because as Asian women and women of color, we encounter sexualized misogyny, street harassment, and abuse in our communities. We did not see a huge report of harassment of children, but we're seeing that parents are very nervous about schools opening up and seeing increased bullying. So I wanted to go into a little bit of our data and show the types of discrimination. We have here our national cases and also cases in central US, so we can kind of have a visual and compare um, the two. The statistics here show 3,800 national cases and 425 cases in the central US. Most of the incidents are verbal, avoidance, and physical. Many of these physical assaults can have multiple parts. For example, being called the Chinese virus and being spat on at the same time. That would be verbal and physical abuse. 90% of our incidents are not hate crimes, but they are hate, they are hate incidents. Although most of our cases are not hate crimes, our survey showed that mental health issues have spiked and we observed a 155% increase in depression among our communities. Although these are not labeled as hate crimes, these incidents of hate are immensely impacting our communities and traumatizing us. So I wanted to go over the site of reported incidents, where these um, hate incidents are happening. We're privileged to be working from home right now, or maybe some of us are, a lot of us are due to the pandemic but we do still have to go get groceries and get our prescriptions filled. We still gotta live our normal lives. We're seeing a huge amount of verbal and physical assault in businesses and on the street. Parks was a big one. People are just trying to have some normalcy during this pandemic and trying to get some fresh air and exercise. This is where they run into situations of hate and discrimination. We witness online harassment at work or through social media. We even have hundreds of people coming onto our site to troll us and write us hate messages. Schools and places of worships have lower numbers because the locations were limited due to COVID in the past year. But as things are starting to open up, as schools are opening up, um, our survey showed that approximately 40% of parents are concerned that their children will be verbally harassed or physically assaulted as targets of COVID-19 blame. And this is our, my final slide. I wanted to go over the targeted ethnicities um, that we're seeing in our report. The most reported ethnicity was Chinese at 37.4 nationally. But it doesn't matter if you're Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Thai, 
we're all subjected to experiencing hate. 23.2% of incidents are characterized by blame for COVID-19. The hostile climate against immigrants and the anti-China, U.S.-China relations issue is reflected virulent is reflecting virulent animosity against Asian Americans as a whole. We did not get a whole lot of Pacific Islander incident reports through our organization, but we took from the AAPI data and saw that 10% of Pacific Islanders are also subject to anti-Asian hate. We're collaborating with more Pacific Islander organizations to be more inclusive of our services and provide resources to the Islander communities as well. So that's the end of my report. Please be in the lookout in the next week to see a new report coming out soon that's gonna include over 7,000 cases, and check out our website for more detailed information on our reports and resources. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eunice, for your um, a current update on the uh, anti-Asian incidents and the hate crime. Thank you very much. So um, our third speaker is Dr. Martin Platt. Dr. Martin Platt has worked as a translator and an interpreter for Southeast Asian languages in courts and the hospitals since 1989, primarily in Thai and Lao, but also Indonesian, Bernese, and Hmong. He was Associate Professor of Southeast Asian Studies um, at Copenhagen University, where he taught languages, literatures, history, and other subjects for 12 years. His book, Eastern Writers, Thai Literature, Writing and the Regionalism in Modern Thailand was published in 2013. Currently, he is an independent researcher, translator, and a consultant. Today, uh, his, the title of his talk is Languages as Bound and a Barrier. Martin. Thank you, Xiaoping. And I'd like to thank the organizers and sponsors for all their efforts in bringing about this important webinar and for inviting me to participate. I'm going to start with a premise, and that is that we are social creatures. We do not, and I would say cannot, exist in isolation. On a more or less daily basis, we interact with others, people we know well, people who are we are familiar with, and people who are total strangers and who we might never cross paths with again. So we are constantly encountering people. And in doing so, we are also assessing or judging them. <clears throat> Excuse me, depending on the context, we might ask ourselves when we encounter someone, is this someone I could ask directions of? Someone I could trust? Someone who might be a threat to me? Someone I could learn from, help, or go on a date with, or whatever. Some years back, there was a column in the New York Times. The writer was a man who, when meeting other men, or even just passing another man in the street, would always ask himself the same question. And that question was, can I take him? In other words, in a physical fight, would I win? I think we assess or judge people, of course, partly on what is visible. Clothes, physical size, behavior, and of course, skin color. Each of us has expectations based on experience, bias, societal influence, and so on, that influence how we interpret and respond to what we see. There's a well-known story of a Western diplomat who lived in China for many years and spoke fluent Mandarin. He was out walking one day and didn't know how to get to the place he was going to. So he stopped two older men to ask directions. No matter how he asked or what he said, the two men just looked at him. Apparently they didn't understand anything he said. So eventually he gave up. And as he started to walk away, he heard one of the men say to the other, I could have sworn that foreigner was speaking Chinese. They could not or would not understand him simply because in their understanding, he didn't look like someone who would speak Chinese. I can imagine some of you wondering, but did he really speak Chinese well enough for those men to understand him? which on the one hand is a reasonable skeptical question. But on the other hand, does asking that question perhaps show the same kind of bias as those two men have? I had a related though perhaps more extreme experience in Thailand when I was living there. I was introduced to someone and we were speaking Thai, talking about my research in Thai literature and so on. And after five or 10 minutes of conversation, speaking only in Thai, 
The man asked me, still in Thai, do you speak Thai? The evidence of his own eyes could not overcome his preconceived belief. He wasn't really asking me that simple question. He was trying to reconcile his worldview with what was, he was experiencing at that moment. His long held and perhaps never questioned belief was in direct contact, conflict with his perceptions. I don't mean to single him out for criticism. On the contrary, I think we all do these things in various ways. Here's another example. In one of the places I worked in Thailand, there was a white American couple and they had a young son about four years old. He learned Thai very quickly as children do with languages and within a few months was fluent. With Thai people, he spoke Thai and with everyone else, he spoke English. And then he and his family moved back to Seattle, which is of course a very diverse city. There he maintained his pattern. He spoke Thai with Asian people and English with everyone else. But most of the Asian Americans he encountered, did not, he encountered did not understand Thai. And when I tried to speak Thai with him, he just looked at me. His categories no longer worked for him. His way of understanding or categorizing the world had become inadequate. He had to develop a new way. This story is not really troubling. It's almost kind of cute. We can say that, see this child's simple view of the world and how it served him only so far. But it's quite another thing when these kinds of assumptions about groups of people persist into adulthood, which they do. I would assert that we all have them to some extent at least, and that we would benefit from examining them, from looking at the stereotypes and expectations that we may hold. When I taught in the Southeast Asian Studies program at the university in Denmark, at the beginning of every year, we would meet with new students to tell them how the program worked and what the plan was. One year, as I was talking to the group studying Thai language, one of the new students stopped me and asked, do you really know Thai well enough that you can teach it? Apparently she took one look at me and wondered how I could possibly teach Thai. In her conception, it seemed, only Thai people could know enough to teach Thai language. But there's another side to this story. The student had a black eye on that day. And after class, she told us that she worked as a bouncer at a bar and had gotten the black eye in the course of her work a day or two earlier. I'll be honest and say that some of us on the teaching staff thought, well, here's someone who doubts the teacher is qualified to do the job and apparently is willing to take part in violent altercations. And we wondered, what kind of student will she be? In fact, she turned out to be one of our best students and one of the most accomplished students of the Thai language. We see people making judgments about language and other things based on physical attributes of people, which more than likely are completely false. But to turn things around, language itself is used as an important criterion for, assess for assessment of people. When we hear a language being spoken, one of the first things we notice is, is it a language I know? If not, we might judge it and its speakers based on our own language cultural criteria. I've heard people say things like, such and such a language is, is the loudest language. They always sound like they're arguing. How come they're so angry all the time? Or even, it sounds so beautiful. These of course are languages that the speaker doesn't understand, the person hearing them doesn't understand. But beyond what they hear, people speak, that is they use and manipulate language to denigrate and reject people as well. Several Asian friends have mentioned to me the strangers on the street sometimes look at them and say ni hao, which is a Chinese greeting. But these strangers are not themselves Chinese. One friend asked me, she said, I'm not even Chinese, I don't speak Chinese. Why are they saying this? And we realized that even though ni hao is a greeting, these people were using it not as a greeting, but in fact, quite the opposite, as a kind of anti-greeting, a way of putting up a barrier, a way of othering, of saying you are different, you're an outsider, you're not accepted. People regularly use language, their own and even others' languages, to express group affiliation for themselves versus other people. There are countless ways to do this, and many or most of them involve denigrating or dehumanizing the person marked as an outsider. Here's another example. When I lived in Bangkok, I often went to the weekend market, which is a huge place with hundreds of vendors on the north side of town. On one particular day I was there, I stood looking at things in one of the stalls and I became aware that the vendor in the stall behind me was talking about me in Thai. Not very loud, but loud enough that people nearby could hear. And the way he was talking was not complimentary. 
In referring to me, he used a word that is normally used to refer only to animals. For those of you who know Thai, he, called, he referred to me as Horang Tuani. So I turned and looked at him. He was a young fellow and he looked at me with no expression, waiting to see what I might do. So I said in Thai, we are not animals, we are people. He acknowledged what I said politely with one word and I walked away. Looking back on this incident, I think he had been bored and casually made an insulting remark, probably just to amuse himself and perhaps those around him. And I felt my response was satisfactory. I didn't escalate, I didn't get angry. I just made my point and moved on. Whether it had any effect on his view of foreigners or on his behavior, I can't say. So obviously this is a minor incident, especially compared to those that we've just been hearing about from the other speakers. Now to get back to what I was saying about assessing people based on language, we might make superficial judgments about languages we don't know, but when it comes to our own language, we make other kinds of judgments, generally much more complicated ones. We can use a common language as a link or a wedge to connect with or to separate ourselves from others. One way is with accents. If you think about regional accents, we see here in the US, for example, that Northerners and Southerners make judgments about each other, Easterners and Westerners, etc., based on their accents. But context is also important. A Bostonian at their local bar may concent might concentrate on differences if encountering someone from, let's say, Atlanta, but might greet the same person as a friendly neighbor if meeting them for the first time in Mongolia. Now, what about foreign accents? Often we judge people negatively who speak our language less fluently or merely differently from the way we speak it. When I was teaching at that university in Denmark, one of my colleagues there, who was from an Asian country, studied Danish at a local language school. She started at the beginning and completed level after level until she had finished the most advanced class. And when she passed the final test, her teacher said to her, congratulations, now you can study at the university. My colleague refrained from replying that she had a PhD and was in fact a tenured professor at the Danish university. That language teacher perhaps had good intentions and wanted to encourage her student to continue studying. But apparently it did not occur to the teacher that regardless of Danish ability, her students might have other qualifications and accomplishments, including some perhaps surpassing her own. In fact, frequently when people have an accent, we tend to think they are less educated, less intelligent, less able, and of lower status. This accent bias is widespread, but largely unrecognized. You've probably all seen someone speaking very loudly to a person with a foreign accent, apparently thinking that somehow that is necessary or helpful. But we might not have thought about the more damaging assumptions that perhaps are being made at the same time. Studies have shown that people tend to distrust those with foreign accents and give less credibility to their statements. Medical practitioners sometimes find that a patient questions their expertise based solely on, a, on accent even to the point of not accepting or following sound medical advice. In court, witness credibility can be affected by accents, either of their own or even of their interpreters. In other words, testimony may be doubted based solely on an accent. As one researcher has commented, discriminating against a person because of the way they speak is as shameful as discriminating against someone for the color of their skin. To conclude, Noticing what language people are speaking and how they are speaking it is something we do automatically as social beings. But what we do with those observations, how we interpret and act on them is something that we can become explicitly aware of. If we examine the kinds of assumptions we hold and the ways that language can be used, even unconsciously, to set up barriers, to exclude and to denigrate others, then we can act in more just ways, both in ourselves and for those around us. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, uh, for your wonderful talk in a very unique perspective about the language barrier as well as stereotype framed by the language. Um, now I would like to bring our all panelists to screen to answer the questions that I have received so far. Uh, please turn on your phone and uh, video probably. 
Okay, great. So uh, I have received uh, quite a lot of questions. So the first question I would like to ask is, I'm not Asian, but have Asian relatives. How best can I support them? They are young and uh, accomplished professionals. It feels uncomfortable and kind of uh, condescending to bring up the subject. I have no problem discussing gender discrimination with them, but that is because I have, uh, I have been there, done that. Please give some advice. You go first. Sure. I think it's really important to approach to Asian American individuals. I don't think you should think that it is condescending to initiate having conversation on this hate, Asian hate. Um, because I, I, let me give you, give you an example. When Atlanta shooting occurred, a lot of students came to Asian American professors at BU. And then they said, professors are not talking about this issue at all. And there was only one professor which acknowledged the Atlanta shooting in the classroom. But at the same time, students are not telling the professors that why don't you talk about this? You see what I mean? A, there are a lot of silence around this issue. And I think there are a lot of people are thinking about this. A lot of people are feeling bad about it, terrible, terrible about this. But they are also calculating, is this, and am I condescending them? Is it, is it okay for me to talk about it? And I don't know how to talk about it. A lot of people don't have language to initiate this conversation. And this is the part of the reason why we are having this conversation, because we need to have this conversation so that we can increase our capacity, our comfort zone to initiate, to listen, to feel more uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable, but we need to have in, engaged in this uncomfortable conversation. So I think it's really important to let them know that you care about them. You can text them and you can make a phone call to them and you can grieve with them and you can worry with them. So I think that's extremely, extremely important to show the human side of our caring. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Sometimes we probably need to downgrade our self-awareness a little bit, just uh, reaching out to people that you care about. Uh, how about, uh, I saw Eunice unmuted herself. Do you want to make some comment on this issue? Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Professor Ham just said. Um, I think if you feel uncomfortable about bringing up the issue, maybe the uncomfortability is because you don't, you're afraid that you're going to say the wrong thing or you're not, you're unsure of yourself. So if you're out there right now listening to this presentation, you're educating yourself and you're trying, to, you're being here and you're showing up to understand the information. And I feel like that's a perfect first step to um, having more solidarity with your Asian neighbors and friends and just having a little bit more confidence to bring it up and, and just being educated about it. Thank you. So I have a quick question for you, Eunice, uh, because during your presentation, you mentioned that after, right after the Atlanta shooting, there was a jump of those uh, uh, reported incidents, right? So actually I would expect a different direction. So do you have some uh, explanation or some input on that? Uh, yeah, well, after the Atlanta shootings, I think, I mean, we were already getting media media coverage, but it just really started to spike. So a lot of people kind of like saw that it, they had the opportunity to report something like an incident um, and, and not a hate crime and particularly not a hate crime. So the difference between a hate incident and a hate crime um, is that a hate crime is officially labeled that when it's um, when it's proven that it was motivated by a bias against a race or a sexual orientation, a background. So um, I think a lot of people, I mean, they felt silenced. They felt unsure of how they can respond to the bias and discrimination that they were facing. And once um, we kind of 
came out with our reports and we saw like that people saw the impact that we're making, the resources that we're providing, they felt more inclined to start um, reporting the incidents. And so that's why we had a huge spike after the Atlanta shootings. And, and a new report is going to come out next week with 7,000 plus cases. Okay, thank you. So I have a, another question. How can we bring up the subject of uh, AAPI violence and uh, discrimination among our allies? How do we approach the conversation? Where should I start and what resources should I share? Mm. So okay. Chris, yeah. I can give a recent example, what happened to my son. So uh, we have three boys and my youngest one is 14 years old and he plays lacrosse. And he's uh, quite a lacrosse player, and uh, but he's Asian boy, so he's like one of the very very few uh, lacrosse player in the field because I think lacrosse is about ninety eight percent white according to my observation of many many years being a lacrosse mom. So last week um, when he was playing against some other opponent team in Massachusetts. Uh, that one of the boy was yelling at him and calling him that he has to go back to China and he should not be in the field. He should be at the library. And on top of that, he was making a lot of very, very mean, you know, mean spirited words. It was very hurting. And he came home, he talked about it. And some of the people like around him heard about it. And Unfortunately, this is not the first event that happened to my son. And it, it happened when he was in the hockey field, when he was in the basketball field. And obviously, it has gone a lot worse since pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he came home and he was, you know, we were having some conversation around this issue. And he was yelling at me. And he said, I know, mom, you're trying to change this world. You're trying to do something to stop this. But this is never going to stop it. This will never stop. And I'm going to have to, you know, deal with this issue all over and over again. And I don't care. All right. So that night, I wrote a letter to the coach. Mm -hmm. And the coach sent a letter to the Lacrosse League. So in Massachusetts, the league, Mass Bay League, has about 26,000 members, which is a huge league. And we had a conversation with coach and the president of Newton, Massachusetts League, and we came up with a plan. So I wrote a letter explaining that this discrimination, the exposure to discrimination among the children, the long-term and the short-term effect of discrimination. And we pressured the league and the league came up with an email, sent out an email to every single families. The longest email that I've ever seen denouncing racism, denouncing racism in the field. And each team in Massachusetts now has to come up with a specific plan to prevent the racism in the field. Not only that, our Newton, Massachusetts uh, lacrosse team asked my son to give a talk about his experience and how can we better how can we reduce this racism in the field? So he, not only him, but his friends, white allies are standing with him. They are going to give a talk together in front of all the parents. So this is an example. They are only 14 years old, but they are becoming allies with Asian American boy, showing the friendship, showing that guys, this is not a joke. This hurts. Words are a seed for the big violence. They are educating people. And this is action that little children are taking, adolescents are taking. And we as an adult, we have to look around. It's always think about the proximity. We can change the world, but think about where we can change the world, what we can do in a small thing we can do. So we were very fortunate to have an allyship with our lacrosse coaches. And they were incredible, the amount of time they're putting in, the amount of seriousness that they're taking it on, and the determination 
to take this down, that this is not going to be happening anymore and zero tolerance policy they were going to create. I've been really impressed by this. Wow, thank you, Chris, for your um, this very powerful and personal story. And then you set a good example to show how, you know, uh, what should we do, you know, to bring the allyship and uh, um, the and also need to be to be to be courageous to confront those those incidents, right? Yeah. So I have uh, another several questions. So could the panelists talk about anti-blackness and anti-Asian discrimination as related struggles? Mm -hmm. hmm. Eunice, would you like to talk or I can go to? Um, sure, I'll, I'll comment on this. Um, so I think this, instead of talking about our common struggles, I think it's better to frame it in a way of like, um, why are we why are we put against each other in in certain circumstances and and that goes back to the model minority myth that professor hum could talk about uh, later but she actually mentioned it in her presentation um there is this paradigm where asians are either on one side or the other we're either closer to whiteness or we're closer to blackness and this has caused a lot of turmoil because um and throughout our history too right and we're actually Asian Americans are actually a lot closer and to to the black community than we think, right? Like, for instance, I live in Oakland right now, and um, why is there Oakland Chinatown, or why is there the projects? It's because we were the Orient, and the Occident wanted us to go away. All throughout history, this is not new. And so, to comment on this, that. Um, we do share certain struggles, but I think it's important to understand why. And it's because this paradigm has given us a label as either a, um, a model minority or perpetual foreigner. And there's just no in between. And so that's why there's been a lot of issues between our communities. Thank you. Yeah. So I can talk about this too. Um, sure. So I think in order for us to understand anti-Blackness and anti-Asianism, we need to understand that these are systemic and this is a structural racism that we are dealing with. So what do you mean by that? Is that if you think about Asians, white and Blacks, we were all categorized based on our skin color, right? Mm -hmm. Starting from the phenotype, our skin color. And based on that, our values are determined. So, so there's a categorization of our values, categorization of the skin color, but by based on that, our values are determined by that. And what do you mean by the values? Value, not only the value, but there's a presumed inferiority and presumed superiority. And there's access to health, access to wealth, access to status, access to resources. Those are all determined based on our skin color. Not only that, our human values are also determined, right? So if you think about the police brutality, in fact, police brutality is sixth cause of death for black male. So that means that is not a black man's problems anymore. It is an incredible public health issues. Okay. But then that is a dehumanization that you can kill a black person and you think that you can get away with that. That idealism, that idea is a sense, is a dehumanization process. And because of the de dehumanization process and dehumanization, there is a stigmatization that, you know, there's a black people here, there's Asian people here. See, there are categorization, right? There's a ladder of the status. And finally, there's a stigmatization, okay? 
and I just read a, one, of, one of the chat that some of the people do uh, are dyeing their hair because they are scared of being mm -hmm. an Asian, right? The, the, the mm -hmm. view as an Asian. That right. also is a similar process, phenotype, okay, and dehumanization and fear of dehumanization is making people really feel like they should not look like Asians anymore. Okay? And that is clear stigmatization. So if you think about the anti-Blackness, anti-Asianism, we are talking about very, very parallel, very, very similar things. Okay? Just that the difference I see is that Asian Americans, we have a, so many different ethnic mm -hmm. groups and status and socioeconomic status and education from the top groups are really exceeding uh, white and black and Hispanics, um, Latinx. So therefore this group, very small segment of groups are being sent out. Mm -hmm. They may look like we are modern minority. However, really we are dealing with the same problem. Mm -hmm. This racism is structural problem. This racism is systemic problems. And therefore we need to work together. Mm. Thank you, Chris. I really um, like your comments. Uh, I have another question specifically for uh, Martin. So do we have uh, organizations across the country to represent Asians who have language barrier in legal consultations or assistance? Because uh, you have worked on this um, for quite a while. So do you know any information Information in, in, yes, in Thank in you for this. that question. Um, and I think this also goes along with what we've just been talking about in terms of uh, st structural racism and, for example, access to resources and to fairness um, in different kinds of institutions in this country. Um, there is, there are some NGOs, for example, that provide, that offer um, interpretation generally by phone um, for those who need it. Um, many legal jurisdictions have their own um, interpreter banks or uh, interpreter offices that will uh, draw on interpreters when necessary. And of course, the larger legal jurisdictions uh, will generally have their own uh, office of interpreter services, for example, who keep a list of interpreters available um, and who try to make sure that people do uh, have access to interpreters when they need them. Um, Apart from that, there are also uh, private, uh, basically commercial business organizations that uh, provide uh, interpreting, especially uh, by phone, but also in person when necessary um, in different areas when, when that's needed. Mm. Thank you for sharing this information. Um, another question. So more people are feeling more confident and uh, comfortable in reporting incidents. Why do you think, why do you think that is? Um, what has changed about our society and uh, has motivated this change? Mm. This is probably, yeah. Um, I think I kind of touched on this earlier, but um, I think that our communities are seeing that you know, our voices matter and that our experiences are real and we are facing discrimination. And this wasn't so blatant in the past, even though we've been experiencing discrimination for ages. And I think this also connects to the model minority myth because we are always told just to keep our heads down and just be quiet and just keep moving throughout society, just work hard and don't make noise. And we've been told this for so, so long that, I think after some of these cases started to come up, like Ficha Ratanapakte, the um, 89 year old, I believe, that was um, pushed over and he ended up mm -hmm. passing away. These right. were really impactful. And I think that it caused, it caused a lot of us, the younger generations and the older generations to say enough is enough. And our voices do matter and our incidents are real. And so I think that caused us to be able to uh, report more and try to make a change. Mm, thank you. And you just mentioned about the the tragic incident. So um, my question is, uh, 
what should we do? For example, if we see those events or those incidents、uh, happening, and、uh, what the what are the resources? Then what should we do? Yeah, I can link、um, some of our safety tips. We have official safety tips on our website, and there's a lot of bystander trainings that people can take.、Um, and so I can't give you one answer of what you should、mm-hmm. do because there's lots of different situations that might happen,、right. and sometimes you have to go with your gut feeling. So I will、um, give some resources into the comments if that's okay, so we could share that. Sure. So other two panelists. Oh yeah. So do you have any suggestions? <laughs> I think what's happening is that you know the reason why Asians have not been reporting, but then now they are more reporting these incidents. I think part of the reason is, you know, seventy five percent of the Asian Americans are foreign born, and Asian Americans have the greatest barriers in、uh, speaking fluent English compared to other Asian groups. So by that definition, Asian Americans have a difficult time in understanding the resources and writing and reporting and calling to the police. Okay, so that's the number one. And then another thing is that when you are immigrants, okay, I came to America at the age of twenty-three, and as an immigrant, you don't quite understand what racism is, like. First fifteen years or so, I mean, I understood like the concept of racism, but I never experienced racism because I I grew up in South Korea. We didn't really feel anything like this. So when they're coming from Asian countries, particularly, they don't really understand what it is. So therefore, it's really hard to talk about racism at home, and it's hard to feel it or. Make sure that this is racism, and it's not necessarily always blatant. Okay,、uh, those microaggression toward Asian has been has been really insidious, but it has not not been very blatant until COVID nineteen. So we are not really used to talk about this sort of stuff, and then COVID nineteen occurred, and then now I think people are realizing Asians are realizing that you know what, just keeping your head down. Working hard, study hard, just do your own work is not going to help us. I think this is a reckoning moment for not only Asian Americans but also all other people. That this is a time that we need to think about the activism and caring for other like Blacks or Hispanics. You know, we need to really work together as、mm-hmm. allies. Right. You know Martin Luther King. He talked about this. He said, "If you don't learn how to live together as brothers, you're going to sink together."、Mm-hmm. Right now, we are at the moment that our public health education. We really have to teach each other that my health affects your health, your health affects my health, my well-being affects your well-being. Either we all learn how to live together, otherwise we are going to sink together.、Mm. Thank you, Chris.、Um, I have another question for I think、uh, specifically directed to Martin. Are there any difficulties in translating from one language to another language? Are there any difficulties in translating to ensure that people are properly represented? Um, I think that's an important question, and I think it brings up an idea that many people hold, which is that when we translate or interpret, we just transform one language into another language. That this language has this idea, and this language has the same idea, and we just ch- say the same thing with different words. But if you really look at it, of course, that's completely false. A language is an entire cultural system enc- encoded in words, and it's not just, you know. Every language has the exact same concepts and ways to say things. We don't,、um, and in fact, many concepts don't exist in different languages. I know from my own experience interpreting.、Um, one of my first interpreting ex- experiences、um, involved discussing probation.、Um, now, in Lao, there's no word for probation because in the Lao legal system there is no probation. There's no concept. So、um, immediately we have an issue. What do we do as interpreters?、Um, 
and for the for the person who is being interpreted for, if you like, um, they're suddenly encountering something that they've never heard of. Um, and I've also noticed that many times when people are are working through interpreters, they're reluctant to stop the person to ask a question. Mm. So often these kinds of issues get glossed over. And mm -hmm. if you're working with people who don't um, use, use different languages themselves, they might, might be totally unaware that there's no word for prob probation in Lao, for example, or any other example like that. Um, and in fact, cultural behaviors when described um, sometimes seem strange because the person who's hearing them and doesn't have any, language, uh, any knowledge of that culture or that language doesn't understand what's happening. Um, for example, I, I'll give a quick example. I was uh, asked to listen to some tapes, um, interviews of a suspect in a murder trial. Well, before the trial, but a murder suspect. And he was Lao. And the detectives interviewing him asked him, you know, what were you wearing when you were in the apartment of this person who was murdered? And he didn't mention wearing shoes. And they said, why didn't you wear shoes? Why weren't you wearing shoes in their apartment? And he said, well, of course, I took them off before I went in. Mm. Now, for him, you didn't even mention that. That's the most obvious thing in the world. Every Lao person takes off their shoes before going to any other person's house. But for those detectives, they had no idea about that. And they thought this was somehow an indication that he was planning to murder the person. And he took off his shoes so that, what, maybe he wasn't going to step in the blood or I don't know what. Um, so they, they completely misinterpreted a very standard um, cultural behavior as somehow uh, indicating guilt. Um, and then of course, since I was listening to the tape, my job was to transcribe and translate what was being said. It wasn't to comment, it wasn't to give you know, cultural uh, orientation or anything like that. But I felt this is something is going on here that is not right. Um, or that at the very least, it has potential for serious misunderstanding and trouble. Um, and so I felt, even though, you know, as interpreters were told, don't insinuate yourself, you know, don't, but I felt that I had to add a little note because I was, I was uh, working for the, for the defense in this case. Um, I felt I had to add a note and say, this is what I observed and this is something that you might, you should pay attention to. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your personal stories. And uh, it seems like not only you translate the language, but also translate to the culture as well. That is very unique. Um, another question, to what extent do you see continuity with anti-Asian violence in the past with the waves of uh, violence happening today? Repeated. Yeah. You mean to, globally? Globally? Uh, it, it says I, I repeated this again. To what extent do you see continuity with anti-Asian violence in the past with the waves of the violence happening today? So what is the connection between past? Mm -hmm. uh, probably talk about the um, Chinese exclusion mm -hmm. and uh, also yes. the nowadays what what is happening like the. Yes. Yeah. So I can just uh, briefly mention that. Uh, so as I talked about in the beginning, the racism against the Asian, it has never been a new thing. Um, so it started off with a incredible racism against Chinese people in the, back in 1800. And it continued, uh, the, the racism was continuing. However, about year 2000 or so, um, people's perception has been changing. I think it has to do with the uh, globalization and there's more acceptance and more opportunity to go to other um, countries. So people's perception have been changing. So uh, the racism against the Asians have been going down actually. Mm -hmm. The statistics shows that. However, it went up dramatically since last year after COVID-19. And the new study actually shows that um, uh, the study asked the question that do you think it has to do with the government um, talking about COVID-19 as a Wuhan virus or China virus? 
And 65% of the people agree that it has to do with those rhetorics. Mm. So um, somebody uh, shared a, their personal story. So I would like to read it uh, to you, to, to our panelists. Uh, it's another question, it's a personal story. I'm thankful to all speeches. I talked to my parents about making comments on the anti-Asian hate events or spoke out, but they don't want me to do anything to avoid danger, which is really sad, but so real. So Chris, what, or Eunice or Martin, what is, what, what are your, what, what do you have in your mind to tell the students or tell the students' parents? I think I understand why our parents are afraid and they are, they've been so conditioned as immigrants. I'm not sure if your parents are immigrants or not, but I guess I'm speaking on myself, but um, our immigrant parents came here to have a better life for us. And so they try to protect us and say, don't speak up, just keep your head down and work hard. And that's how you'll succeed. Um, so I can understand why they would be afraid, but um, at least for myself, I felt a responsibility um, as I've experienced racism myself and I've seen my communities experiencing racism. I just couldn't sit there and, any longer and just um, keep moving throughout life um, that way. So that's why I decided to, to speak up and advocate for my communities. I'm not sure if that answers the questions, but yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you I for think, sharing your mind, Chris. Yes, I think this is a time that we need to be courageous. This is a time that we need to think about us versus myself. My parents are in Korea because I came to America by myself as a student. Mm -hmm. And they watch TV and there's always, like every day, <laughs> they show anti-Asian racism and events. So they are calling me every single day. And, but they also know that I'm giving a lot of talks on this issue. Mm -hmm. And they say, be careful, be careful. <laughs> yeah. or they say, Don't go outside by yourself, <laughs> you know, a lot of things. I can understand them, you know, even though they are not immigrants, they are in Korea, but mm -hmm. I can understand their love toward me, their worry and caring toward me. But let's think about this. If we are silent, what's going to happen to our children? Mm -hmm. Do we want our children 20, 30 years later having the same discussion? And do we want our children to dye their hair so that mm. they don't look like Asian Americans? Do we want our children to be dehumanized and stigmatized and mm. perpetually marginalized? Mm. That's the question. If we don't do anything about it today, right now, we are going to inherit the gift of racism mm. to the entire nation and to our own children. So you have the answer. Thank you. So Martin, probably you worked with a different uh, groups of uh, uh, Asian, Southeastern Asian people, I assume that they also have a similar reactions. Yes, I think your, your question shows an important um, phenomenon, let's say, which is that um, immigrants and their children have differences, right? Um, mm -hmm. And there is a generation gap as there is with any parents and children, but there's also in many cases a culture gap, there can be a language gap. Um, and so often the parents and their children see things in very different ways and act in different ways. And I think this is one of the real difficulties of challenges um, in this example, but also in general. The children feel that they need to act in a certain way. For example, in this case, to speak out, to speak up for themselves, but the parents are coming from a different perspective and feel that, well, will that endanger us more? We just want to, um, you know, keep our heads down as you're saying and, and so on. So this is a challenge that is kind of an example of, of a greater challenge, which is this 
this generation gap, this cultural gap, which is, is I think, being basically, you know, being faced virtually every single day um, in families. Mm. Thank you. Oh, um, time is raining out, um, even though I have uh, still a lot of unanswered questions, <laughs> but we have to um, conclude here. So I hope from today's webinar, um, we approach this uh, pressing issue, the racism against the Asians and uh, Pacific Islanders with a fresh perspective. So I also feel like from today, from today's talks that uh, a lot of things need to be done at the personal and the societal level. So at last, I would like to invite the Associate Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the TPS College of Business at UI, um, Gabriela Rivera, to have the concluding remarks. Gabriela? Thank you to our panelists um, for sharing their knowledge, personal experiences, and resources for a call to action. I, ident I identified as a, a Mexican immigrant uh, to the state of Iowa. I was personally upset and sad by learning about the multiple incident reports in Iowa and ac across the country. Um, Anti-Asian sentiment is not new in the United States, United States, and yet increases have seemingly followed by the COVID-19. This trend is troubling for many reasons, not the least of which is the dramatic impact that harassment, violence have, both, have on both victims and the broader community. I think we all learned that today, um, as is stated by Eunice Kim, Older and younger generations are standing up and saying, if enough is enough. I think that really resonated with me as a mother of three children. And also to be courageous, as stated by Dr. Ham. I really appreciate that message. On behalf of our planning committee, we hope that by joining today's webinar, you learn something that will raise your awareness to stand in solidarity with Asians, Asians Americans, and Pacific Islanders, and to work towards confronting these problems and to embrace or share humanity. Our goals are for everyone to be their authentic self, to thrive and to feel safe. For that to happen, we must celebrate our differences and stand up against racism. Recently, our community and in the United States, Iowa City in the United States, everywhere, we have seen, um, maybe participated in marches and rallies in support of Asians, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Social media hashtags of stop Asian hate and racism is a virus have brought further attention to this heartbreaking trend. One of the ways we can help include the simple step, what we're doing today, educate ourselves. In that spirit, let us take a moment to educate ourselves, learn of resources even beyond this webinar and the history of the, the, the contributions. As we did during this webinar right here in our state of Iowa in, at the University of Iowa, we have lots of resources. Um, just to name a few, um, Maze Around the Corner, uh, it is a traditionally Asian American Heritage Month nationally. I hope that everybody will take the time to celebrate this beautiful community. I know personally the Asian Pacific American Cultural Center, APAC at the University of Iowa already hold events in the month of April to celebrate, educate, bring awareness, um, just to celebrate the community here at our university. You can actually follow them on Instagram and see what they kind of events they host then. You can also Google the University of Iowa celebrating Asian heritage video. Uh, together we stand, together we rise. There's also other um, supports such as the Pan Asian Council at the University of Iowa. You can build coalition and become an ally. This council welcomes individuals whose goal is to uplift and advocate for the many voices in our community. And finally, 
Um, you can also learn more about the work that the Manson and Des Moines based organization that serves victims, survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking among the Asian, Asian Pacific Islander communities in Iowa. In Iowa. So finally, I want to thank again our panelists, our audience for the rich and interesting questions tonight. I really want to give a special thank you to the following partners, again, international programs, the Center for Asian and Pacific Studies, the College of Dentistry, the TP College of Business, my home, the numerous University of Iowa and community collaborators for making this webinar possible. You saw the long, long, long list of people at the beginning of this webinar, and that really was a big accomplishment for our committee, committee and for the panelists to have you and be able to host you tonight at this webinar. At this time, I would really like to invite everyone to join me in honoring Asians, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders with us by holding or up her heartfelt solidarity. Have a great night, everyone. We really appreciate everyone tonight. Thank you.